I have spent days and days researching mini splits, all the different options that are out there, as well as the full installation process. I then went through that process myself, installed everything as a first timer, and I found that there were so many details that get skipped or glossed over in other videos or articles. Today, I'm gonna to share with you every single step that you need to properly install a mini split yourself with no problems, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll feel totally confident to do this yourself. First thing we're gonna do is figure out where the studs are on the indoor unit. Now, this is not te technically required. You can actually do this just with the drywall anchors that are included, but by knowing where the studs are, if it happens to line up well there, you can use those. Uh, a few things to consider are, number one, that you need about six inches of space above it and six inches to either side. And the manual is a little confusing because it often talks about how you need eight to nine feet underneath it. So you want this eight to nine feet in the air. This is a little bit taller ceiling than normal. This is nine feet, but obviously I can't put it nine feet in the air and still have six inches above. So basically, if you've got an eight to nine, uh, even a 10 foot ceiling, put it six inches away from the very top. Now I'm gonna mark a few holes where I want this to be installed, and there's like a thousand holes in here. So you basically you wanna pick the ones that match the best. If there's a stud, great. Otherwise you can do just some that are spread out, make sure they're symmetrical from one another, and you'll be in good shape. I'm gonna use a quarter inch drill uh, to drill the holes out here. Okay, and then I'm gonna tap in the included drywall anchors. Once you've got your first screw in, it's a good idea to make sure everything is level. Right there, perfect. Then I can secure the others. The instructions I'm showing here are applicable to just about any mini split on the market, but the specific unit I'm using here is made by Toso. This is a 12,000 BTU unit. It's super efficient and it's probably overkill for my space, but it's definitely got everything that I need and it works as a great heater and air conditioner. There's actually one big difference between, for example, the Mr. Cool DIY unit and a unit like this Tosote, and it's a difference that costs you hundreds of dollars. I'm gonna show you in just a few minutes the steps that you need to do the vacuum pumping yourself so that you can save that money and put it in your pocket. If you're considering buying a Tosote mini split, definitely check out the links in the description below because you can save more by getting it directly from the website than going to Amazon, and it still has free shipping. We need to prepare the indoor unit, so to do that we're gonna flip this over, and I've already removed the mounting plate that was attached right here, and so that one's, that one's taken off. There's just one screw right here holding that in place. And then we have to figure out where the exhaust and all the pipes are gonna go. So they could go out uh, straight out this way, they could go out the side, and if they need to go out the side, you can knock out this panel just by using some wire cutters or even some stronger scissors to remove this whole panel here. Otherwise, it stays in place as a decorative cover. And then it can also go out this side or, or right the back or out this side. So in my case, uh, this needs to go out the lower left right here. So I want everything to come out this way straight through the wall. So I'm gonna remove our um, drain pipe here. Now these, this I don't actually need to move at all. It's just gonna stay right where it is, but I do need to expose all of this so that we can get it connected to our pipes. This part right here is just a little cap and you're gonna hear it drain a little bit of gas come out, which is a good sound. We wanna hear that when I pierce this. I'm just gonna use the end of my pliers here. Okay, good, that's the sound we want. And then I can remove that black cap. And then we'll do the same thing over here. This one doesn't need to be pierced, just need to remove that cap. Next, we need to straighten out our copper pipes here. And so you can put some gentle pressure, you can kind of step on them, but I'm outside, I'm just gonna roll these out to try to get them as straight as can be. It doesn't, doesn't have to be perfect. There we go. Now that we've straightened out our lines, we're gonna remove the covers from these. Then we're gonna thread these on making sure to thread this part, not this one. This one shouldn't twist. Line it up. There. We want it snug, but you don't need to crank the thing down. There we go. Next, we're gonna pop the cover open on our Toso unit here. And then we need to access our wire connections under here. So just remove the one Phillips screw push this panel out a little bit like that. We'll set that aside. 
and that gives us access to our neutral one, two, and three and ground wires here. We've got two sets of wires available that come with your kit. So you've got one that has three plus a ground and one that has two plus a ground. The two plus a ground, we're gonna set that aside. That's our power wires for later. This is our signal cable, and these are the three that we're gonna use. Now that we've got that front panel ready, we're gonna feed the wires through this hole in the back. One, two, three, four in there, and then push them out the front. Once they're out the front, we flip it back onto its back, and now we can connect the wires into the terminals. Be sure to check your manual to see which screws go in which color wires, and then we'll tighten each one of these down. Once we've got our three connections in place, we need to fasten down the wire here. So we're gonna remove our, our uh, wire tie down and then put that screw back in. And that makes it so that if the signal cable here gets pulled, it's not gonna pull these connections loose. With that, we're ready to put our service panel cover back on. So we need to cover this part up and you can just actually tear this stuff up really easily to get the length that you need. I'm gonna go a little shorter than that. And then you can just open it up, wrap it around, and then use some electrical tape to cover everything up. And it's a good idea to do this in the direction uh, that you're actually moving. So you want your tape to be moving away from the indoor unit. So in my case, it's gonna be from this side out this way. So I'm just gonna wrap some of this up starting over here. And there we go. Next, we're gonna cover this back up as much as we can. There's great. Now with our signal cable, in the binding here, or in the mix, I'm just gonna start wrapping all of this up with my insulating tape, and I'm gonna, again, start from this side and work my way down uh, quite a ways down these lines. Now this stuff tends to stick pretty well to itself, but it doesn't stick to much of anything else. In fact, I'm gonna buy myself a little space by pushing this out like so, and bind it up. Now about the time that you get to your drain pipe, you've got to figure out which way this is all going to exit. And so in my case, it's actually gonna come straight out the back of the indoor unit here. So I need to very carefully bend these pipes. I'm gonna do a kind of a soft bend as best I can to where they come out away from the indoor unit like that. And then I'm gonna keep wrapping and wrap everything together at this point, including the drain. When we get towards the end of the drain pipe here, we're gonna connect the extension on there, like so, and then we'll just keep on going all the way down the line. Okay. Now that I've got most of my line wrapped here, the next thing we need to do is to drill the hole for the line to fit through through the wall. Now in order to do this, I've measured the unit for the indoor piece here, as well as where this comes out, the line will come out, and how that fits in relation to the tabs that will fit inside our mounting bracket. Now I've got the spot marked right here, and just make sure to double check your measurements on this. I know my shirt says I only measure once, it's a joke. Make sure to measure twice or three times so that you don't have to drill multiple holes through your wall. I'm using a two and one eighth inch hole saw here. This is one I've used many times, and that's kind of the perfect size. You can do a two inch, but that's pretty tight, so if you can get a little over two inch, that's definitely best. When I drill this hole, I'm aiming for a five to 10 degree angle upward. So instead of perpendicular to the wall like this, I'm gonna angle it up just a little bit like this for drainage to help everything slope downward. Okay, there's my plug and this is insulated. So I've got some insulation here that I'm gonna have to cut through and move out of the way. Now, because hole saws have a pilot drill bit like this one, I just need to drill a small hole that gets through to the other side. So I've mounted a slightly longer drill bit here that's also a quarter inch, this little spade bit. And again, I'm gonna hold it at a little bit of an angle, five to 10 degrees up, 
And my, my goal here is just to drill a hole through to the outside of the shop. Okay, I've got daylight there, so we're in good shape. So we're able to see the hole that poked through on the outside. So I'll line that up with my pilot drill bit, get a bit, that little bit of an angle upward in this case, and then drill that hole through. Okay, so I'm through my outside paneling. Okay. There we go. So make sure between layers, you might have to pop the uh, board out depending on what your outside piece is. If you have stucco, for example, uh, you might have some chicken wire back there and some mesh. And so you got to do whatever you got to do to get through this and make that hole. Okay, now that I've got this ready and the hole punched through, I'm going to feed my longest wire, which in this case is the signal, out. Have that come out of the hole. And then I've got these bottom two sections of the lines unwrapped. I'm going to carefully feed those out, trying not to tear the uh, foam insulators. There they go. So far, so good, I think. This is where it's definitely handy to have two people. And I might need to go on the other side to pull the slack out before I continue. Okay, carefully feed this out. And this is why we wrapped it from the indoor unit towards the outdoor. That are sticking out. There we go, just a little bit. And now, oh, look at that, beautiful. That is exactly where we need it. Indoor unit is installed. Looks level, I think we're in good shape. Once those lines are installed, you can use the included gum type sealer to pack everything in and then place the sleeve around the outside. This just keeps all of the elements out and keeps everything insulated and waterproof. I'll come back at the end and do a bit of caulking here just to finish things up. Now, as far as mounting the outside piece here, the condenser, we have a few options. One option is to pour a concrete pad and set it in the concrete pad and bolt it down. Uh, that is kind of a pain in the butt to do, honestly. So there's a much easier and less expensive and faster way to do that. And that's using this wall mount bracket for a condenser. So this one is rated for up to 300 pounds, which is way overkill. If I'm not mistaken, this unit weighs about 83 pounds. So I just got this one because it's local and I didn't want to wait. I wanted to get this done today. So that's the one I'm going to be using. However, I'll put some links in the description to ones that start at about 30 bucks and go up to maybe 60 or 70 bucks. And those can be delivered in just a couple of days. And you can buy those along with the other parts that I'm going to show you that we'll use in just a minute here. Now, as far as spacing, it's recommended that you have about one foot on the left and the back of the unit. On the right, you need a little more, maybe 20 inches of space as well as on the top. And then ideally you should have many feet of space in front of it so that it can pull in as much air as it needs to. The first thing you need to do is locate where the studs are so that you make sure you're fastening this top rail into the studs. And then I highly recommend that you pre-drill everything for the lag bolts that go in. Be sure to use a level so you don't have a crooked condenser out there. From there, you can fit the arms to where they need to go and you can check these for level as well. This kit makes it pretty easy with several adjustment places to be able to make sure the arms are nice and level. These brackets also allow you to fasten in each of the arms so that everything is totally secure. Nothing is gonna be shaking or vibrating on this. Now, of course, it was only then that I realized that I had better actually measure how far apart the feet on the condenser were, and I had to remove those lag bolts, spread everything out a little bit, and then get that right measurement. I then put the condenser on the brackets and then fastened everything down. Now, just a reminder, you want to make sure to put that condenser as far away from that wall as you can. Ideally, you're going for about 12 inches of space. The last step is just to install the drain on the bottom of the condenser. Next, we need to figure out if you're going to cut the lines or coil them like I'm doing here. 
Now in most videos that you'll see, they coil the lines and the reason is it really does almost nothing as far as the impact on efficiency or anything like that. If you do have a flaring kit and you have the desire to cut those lines to length, you can do that. It's not very difficult and flaring kits are only about $25 at Harbor Freight, but if it's only a coil or two like I've got in my scenario here, a lot of times it makes sense just to go ahead and coil it up, place that behind and then connect it that way. When you've got your coils in place, you can finish wrapping up the low pressure and high pressure lines and you wrap those individually like I'm doing here. And then from there, you've got your three stems coming out, high pressure, low pressure, and the signal cable. Next, I needed to cut my drain pipe free from the tape. I used a blade to cut the drain pipe out very carefully so that I wouldn't damage anything else. My goal here was really just to get it free enough to where it would drain down onto the ground. Very little water comes out of these, so I just needed enough to get those few drops to be able to go to the right place, rather than following the line down. Next, I remove the service panel for the high and low pressure lines. Remove the covers for the lines, and I'm using a pair of vice grips here just to hold the fixture secure so that I'm not torquing against the actual unit itself. This just helps prevent any breakage or kinking or damages. Now just like before, you can use some nylog glue if you want to here. I didn't use any and didn't have any issues with leaking or anything like that. So it's not required, but it can help. It's just an added level of security there. I tightened down my lines for both high and low pressure. And as far as torque, there is a chart that's included, but most of us don't have a way to really test that and get the exact right torque. So just get it snug and make sure it's on there nice and tight. Next, remove your remaining three caps for the service port and the valves. Now when you buy your mini split, it's either gonna come with lines that are pre-evacuated or you may need to evacuate it yourself using a vacuum pump like you see here. Now believe it or not, this step saves you hundreds of dollars by buying the kind that are not pre-evacuated. This little 5 CFM pump cost only 116 bucks and I'll put links to that in the description. It comes with its own oil, so the first thing you'll need to do is fill it up in between the min and max lines using the little bubble indicator on the front of the pump. The next piece you'll need to purchase is the two-way manifold gauge set. Again, links are in the description and these go for about $60 on Amazon. And the last piece that you're going to need is a 5 16 quick coupler to quarter inch male flare adapter. You can get a two pack of these for about nine bucks online or you can often find them at local plumbing or HVAC stores nearby. This piece screws into the blue pipe from the manifold gauge set. The adapter then gets fastened into the service port on the low pressure line. So here's the entire setup as far as the vacuum pump is concerned. Your yellow line goes from the vacuum pump to the middle port on the manifold gauge. And then your blue line goes on the left port of the manifold gauge and then into the service port of the low pressure line on your condenser. Now this part is optional. I actually don't know if it helps any, but I did cap off the right port. I actually don't think it matters as long as you close that right valve. Now I'm closing the left valve here as well before I turn the pump on. And then when you're ready to start the system, open that left valve up and then turn on the vacuum pump. Watch that dial indicator on the left dial. You'll see it go down. There we go. You should see the needle go to about negative 30 on the gauge. And then that's gonna go down. You're gonna let this run for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, take a look and make sure everything is still good. And by still good, I mean it's still at negative 30. It shouldn't be moving much, shouldn't be going up, shouldn't be going down much. Once it's gotten to that original state, it should be staying there. If everything looks good, then close that left dial altogether turn off the vacuum pump. At this point, you wanna let it sit for about five minutes or more. In fact, I gave it 15 minutes again, just to be sure. And what we're looking for is that once again, nothing is moving. We wanna make sure that it's not losing pressure, that we're not getting any air in the lines and that nothing is going wrong there. Assuming that's the case, you can start to disconnect everything. Disconnect your service port. Be sure to place the cap back on the service port. You can then use a five millimeter Allen wrench to open up the valves to allow the refrigerant and everything into the lines for your low pressure and high pressure lines going back to your indoor unit. These are pretty easy to open and you'll definitely feel when it starts to resist when you get to the all the way open state. No need to push it. Now to make sure everything is leak free, you wanna spray some soapy water onto all of your joints. And what you're looking for is any bubbles that are being created. You'll get some bubbles initially when you spray it, but then it shouldn't be generating any new bubbles. If it is, that means you might have some air coming out and you need to tighten things up even better. Keep an eye on this process for three or four minutes to check for any leaking at all. If everything looks good, you can dry it off, put your two caps back on, and then replace the service cover. 
Now, don't mind my ghetto cover here that I had to tape up. The UPS company kind of bashed in our condenser unit a little bit. So I've got a new one coming from Toso. They were happy to replace it. But in the meantime, I wanted to get it covered up. I put together this diagram to show you what's coming next, and a lot of people don't explain this real well, but basically, by code, in the United States at least, and you'll want to check your local code both in the U.S. and outside the U.S., you need to have an AC disconnect, or an air conditioner quick disconnect, within just a few feet of your condenser. So up on the top, we've already got our indoor unit installed inside the shop, then we've got our refrigerant lines, signal cable, and condensate drain coming down. Those connect to the outdoor unit or the condenser, which is sitting on the wall mount. Now the next steps that we're gonna take are everything on the right. Now starting from the very right, we have our circuit breaker box, and the location of this will vary depending on your situation. I've got one on the outside of my house, but here on the wood shop, it's inside the wood shop and it's a separate sub panel. So I need to run a line from my circuit breaker box to the outside of the shop and get it to that AC disconnect. So in order to do that properly, I need to use some EMT or conduit and I'm gonna run that with my wire inside of it going to the AC disconnect, and then I use what's called a whip to connect the AC disconnect to the condenser. Now just to be super clear on this, I highly recommend that you have an electrician either help you out with this, guide you on this, or do it for you. I'm pretty comfortable with this electrical work and have done a lot of this before, and so I'm happy to walk you through it, but I always recommend that you have an electrician check your work, consult with you, or just do the job. In order to move forward with the electrical work, we need to know what size of breaker we need and if it's single pull or double pull, and then what size wiring we need with that. Now most of this will depend on the mini split that you're using. I've got a 12,000 BTU that runs on 220 volt. And by the way, 220 or 230 are the same thing. 110 to 120, also the same thing. Those are just acceptable ranges within your voltage. So you can see on the second row there, my 12,000 BTU 220 volt would require a double pole 15 amp circuit breaker. And then along with that, I wanna run at least 14 two cable. And all that means is the gauge or the thickness of the wires is 14 gauge. And then the two means that there are two wires in there besides the ground. So I've got a neutral, a line, and then a ground. That said, you always wanna make sure that your Romex or the wire that you're using matches the amperage of the breaker. The last thing you wanna do is put a 30 amp double pole breaker in there and then connect that with some 14 gauge wimpy little wire that can't handle that capacity. Before you touch anything, make sure the power is completely off to everything that you're gonna be working on. With that off, I was able to remove the door for my circuit breaker panel inside the shop. And then I cut open the drywall so that I can drill through some of the studs behind there to pass the line. Now, yes, this is a little bit of a pain if you have to do it this way, because you're going to have some drywall repair after. But I've got some videos showing you how to repair that as well, if you want to check those out. Next, I measured the height that I needed to drill from the outside so that I knew exactly where that wire would go as it connects to the circuit breaker panel. Now, because I had a large elbow box being installed, I wanted to drill a fairly large hole that that could countersink into. And also, yes, I should have been wearing some safety glasses while I was drilling. I then used a one inch drill to drill through the center of the stud so I could pass my wire through to the circuit breaker panel. Like butter. Circuit breaker panels have pop outs all over them that are meant for just these sorts of additions. This particular unit came with this 16 gauge wire. There's about 16 feet of it and that's fine, I guess. I just don't feel really comfortable using 16 gauge wire when we're running a 220 amp on a condenser. So I happen to have some of this stuff. You can see the bag's been around. It's been in my shop for a while and I haven't used it, but I think it's time to use it. This is a uh, 10 gauge and it's three wire plus ground, which is more than we need. We just need two wires plus ground, but wire is expensive and I don't want to go buy another one. So I'm just going to use this one. It's 15 feet, which is enough. And so I'll run this into our circuit breaker panel and then out to our disconnect. And I'll show you that process now. I fed my 10 gauge wire into the shop and then into the circuit breaker panel itself. Anything that's coming into the circuit breaker panel should have a collar on it that helps hold it in place so that nothing can get yanked or tugged out of place. Now I did do things a little out of order here. I really should have fed the wire with the sheathing into the box and then stripped it, but I got a little ahead of myself there. From there, I could snap my adapter into the box and then prepare my lines. Now this is a process I call clip and strip. You wanna clip everything to the exact length that it needs to be for inside your circuit breaker box. And then you need to strip off usually about a half inch or so from the end. Now because I've got the 10-2 wiring here, I wanted to get the 30 amp double pole breaker to match that. 
As you can see up towards the top on that second row, all I really needed for this case was a double pull 15 amp circuit breaker if I was using the 14 gauge wire. The circuit breaker just snaps into place. You hook the right side in if it's on the right side of the panel and then push it onto its receptacle. On a double pole circuit breaker like this, there are a couple of ways you can handle this, but to make things simpler as far as color coding, I decided to install the neutral and the line, which is the black, right into the circuit breaker itself. So in this box, the connections that we've made are the ground that goes to the ground bus bar, and then we've got our neutral and our lines, the black and white, that are connected to the double pole circuit breaker itself. To keep my red line out of the way, I simply put a cap on it and moved it to the bottom of the box. I then cut the paper on my insulation to wrap around the wiring so that it's still at its full size and full efficiency, hopefully. From there, you can remove the plates for your circuit breaker and then make sure to label it while you're there. The elbow box that I mentioned earlier is pretty easy to work with. I'm just gonna loosen up both screws and take one out and then you can feed your wire through it and through to the other side. The whole purpose of this piece was just to get a nice 90 from the corner of my shop out towards the AC unit. I then measured how much Romex came out so I knew how long to cut my EMT conduit. Now this conduit is pretty easy to work with. This stuff costs about 10 bucks. I'm using some 3 quarter inch here. And then I've got a really simple pipe cutter here. And you just tighten it a little bit, spin it around a few times, tighten it more, and eventually it snaps off. You can then use the reamer on the back of it to clean it out a bit. I'm using these 3 quarter inch compression connectors. These have an insulated throat which helps keep the wires protected. They're super easy to use. You just slide the sleeve onto the conduit and then thread the adapter onto the sleeve. Make sure to do this for both ends and then once those are in place you're ready to feed your wire through. That adapter threads into the elbow box and fits in there nice and secure. I then installed some 3 quarter inch mounting brackets once I had leveled the pipe to make sure everything was secure to the shop and also quite level. Now this is the AC disconnect that I referred to earlier. These are pretty inexpensive. I picked this one up at Home Depot for 12 bucks and this one can handle up to 60 amps and up to 240 volts. Now you'll see on the bottom there it says non-fusible polar and that means it doesn't include a fuse you're going to see fused and non-fused disconnects. I'd recommend going with the fuseless because you really don't need a fuse on there when you've got your circuit breaker on the other end of the line already. Inside the box, there's a little cover that needs to be removed, and from there you've got the same knockouts that you saw in the circuit breaker panel box. Just like before, we'll get our knockouts ready to accept our connectors. Now this is the power whip that I used, which is a 3 quarter inch 6 foot power whip, but I will recommend that you use a half inch power whip, and you'll see why in just a couple of minutes here. And essentially a power whip is just an outdoor rated hose with some power lines inside, and it's all rated for outdoor electrical work. Be sure to thread your connections in nice and tight. I used a few screws to secure it to the side of the shop, and then used the strip and clip process to get my wires ready. There is a diagram that comes with this, and the gist of it is you want to have your incoming wires on the inside and your outgoing wires on the outside. Once again, I had that extra red wire, so I capped that off and left it at the bottom of the box. Next, I fed my wires in from the whip, and that little gray nut on the left has threads inside of it so that you can twist the outside housing and it will fasten right in there nice and tight. Again, I stripped and clipped the whip wires, and then this is what the finished product should look like inside your AC disconnect. Probably minus that extra red wire on the bottom for most people. Then you can put the cover on, and it's up to you if you want to leave this on or off right now. I decided to leave mine off just for safety purposes. So upside down is off, and right side up is on. Now this was another lesson learned for me. I decided to cut my sheathing to length after the fact, and that's a little bit dangerous to do. You don't want to clip those wires inside. So ideally you should cut it to length and then feed your wires in last. I cut my wires to length and then threaded on the other adapter that goes on the other side. Now it was at this point that I realized that the three quarter inch whip was just too big. Luckily I have a bunch of tools and so I was able to use a monster Dremel type tool to carve out the inside of that hole. So again, if you use a half inch whip, you shouldn't have this issue. Now it's just a matter of connecting all of the wires to the connectors. 
So the bottom row in this case is the incoming power. The right terminal is your ground, the middle terminal is your line or the power source, and then the left terminal is the neutral. For the top, again, you wanna refer back to your indoor unit and make sure it's wired up exactly the same as what you see there. Once those are secure, you can put your cover panel back on with the two screws, one on the bottom and one on the top. Okay, hang in there. We are super close to getting this thing all the way done. So the next step is a bit of weatherproofing for the outside. So I applied some outdoor rated caulking to the elbow, to the sleeve for the line, and to the AC disconnect. It's always a good idea in each of these cases to leave the bottom portion uncocked. So you can apply some caulking to the sides and the top, and that way if any moisture does get in, it has a way to escape out the bottom. And finally, I could take off that yellow label and this installation should be all set. I flipped on the power at the main panel as well as the circuit breaker on the sub panel. Moment of truth, let's see what happens here. Nothing. Oh. I forgot to turn it on outside in the disconnect. It's currently disconnected. One sec. I left my connector in the off position from earlier. Let's try it again. Ooh, there we go. We got juice. 68. Doors opening. Sweet. So the first thing we're going to do is run it for 15 minutes at the hottest setting. Look at that, 117 degrees coming out of there. That's awesome. So now we've got it on the cool setting and it is cool. Take a look at this. 44 degrees, 43 degrees, 41 degrees. So that is nice and chilly. It's definitely cooling this place down. Now this was a part I had been excited about for ages. This is the giant 84 pound window unit that I had that I got to take out. And honestly, for the first time since I built the shop, I got to close the window and see both sides of the window. Look at that, nothing at head height to smack my head on. And this thing was totally done and working so well. Now the remote control on these things has about a million functions. Number one, you can see what your thermostat is set to, and it does both heating and cooling on automatic. So you don't have to switch between heat and cool. You can just say, keep it at this temperature, whatever it takes. It's got all kinds of sleep functions and all kinds of good stuff in there. And you can even set it to display the outside temperature or the inside temperature on the display. Another thing I just love about the mini split is that it will actually allow you to spread the air all around the room rather than just one location. So it's got a motor and it will move things around, up, down, and you can set if you want it to go always low, medium, high, oscillate between all of them, anything you want. Now in this video, I have presented a lot of information, including diagrams and charts and things that you might want to look back at. So if you look at the link in the description below to my website at learntodiy.com, I've got an article that I've posted all of that information on so you can go check that out. I've also got all of the links to the tools and the supplies that you'll need for this project, both down in the description and on the website. Now, if you're still in the research and shopping phase and looking for which mini split to get, my next video that you'll see right up here talks about the difference in the cost between these true DIY ones and the ones that are not so DIY, which actually is a bit of a misnomer. So you might wanna check that out. Thanks for watching.